drink beer, it's good for you. I'm empty handed and I'm filled blue, and I'm gonna drink till the day that I die. Hello, and welcome to the video. In this video I will be revealing everything relative to the Belgian quadruple beer style. This will include style notes, recipe writing guidelines and also one of my recipes of this style for you to try also. This beer style is also known as the Grand Cru in Belgium and the use of the term quadruple is actually going back to a brand name that seems to have stuck as its style name for many Europeans and folk in the US. This style is also known as the Belgian Dark Strong Style. Its history is somewhat undocumented compared to other styles and as such it is not easy to be safe to say if the style that we enjoy in this name today is actually the one of great history or not. The only reports we have on documentation suggest that this style only dates back to 1830 in its rough current form but dark strong beers were being brewed way before this of course, and they could have been in this form too, it's just not proven. The first beer to be called a quadruple was actually only released in 1991, so its current public style name is rather a recent thing. There are many great commercial examples of this style out there. Every one of the types that I show on the screen now are well worthy of your money, and some of these represent my favourite beers in the world. Do not feel that these styles have to be branded as Trappist. There are plenty of great beers out there that are not part of this Trappist organisation. So let's now look at what defines this style for competition. When it comes to aroma, this is complex with a rich malty sweetness with some mild spice. The malt is rich and strong. Fruity with raisin, plum, dried cherry, fig or prune notes. Some styles are more boozy than others. A little noble hops presence is acceptable. Appearance wise we have deep amber to deep coppery brown in colour. Which is perfectly fine. But more and more this is a black dark colour. The flavour is similar to the aroma plus perhaps some sweetness on the initial taste too. Finish is variable and can range from very dry to sweet. This has a very low bitterness for a beer of its strength. Alcohol provides some balance to the malt. In regards to mouthfeel you should really have a high level of carbonation that provides a smoothness but a noticeable alcohol warmth. Body can certainly be very variable because of the use of sugar in this brew and certainly this style would never be as hot heavy body wise as a non-Belgian high alcohol style. And finally the overall impression of this beer is that it's a dark, very rich, complex, very strong Belgian ale that is smooth and very dangerous. I will pause these notes now so that you can take a screenshot if required. This complete summary should prove useful when writing your own recipes. More on that shortly. Here are the vital statistics for this style shared by the BJCP. They rate this style in alcohol content as between 8 to 11%, but to my mind this style really starts at 10% and goes past 11 Colour also varies more than listed, as does bitterness in terms of commercial brews. IBU wise I would suggest shooting for whatever gives you a bittering units to gravity units ratio of 0 0.30. Using BU to GU is a much more precise way of looking at your finished recipe's balance rather than simply quoting ranges of IBU and alcohol. Grain bill wise the following can be used as good guidelines. Pale ale or Pilsner malt will be the base malt often in a high percentage of about 70% plus. This base malt provides the bulk of the fermentables but also a fairly clean canvas in which your other malts will add flavouring and texture too. Dark candy sugar will provide up to 20% of the fermentables. It doesn't really have to be dark, but you will miss out on some of those extra flavours that this sugar provides. If the price of candy sugar is an issue for you, then it's easy enough to make your own, and there are plenty of guides online in various formats. This sugar can be obtained in sugar rock form or syrups. Never think of adding sugar as a fermentable to beer recipes as cheating, 
and that you should only just use grain. The sugar element of Belgian and also some British beer recipes is actually key to the styles. This is because the sugars provide fermentables but not body at the same rate as grain. These styles are high in alcohol but thus are much lower in body compared to other styles with the same level of alcohol which itself lends to drinkability, and this drinkability is the dangerous element of Belgian beer. Using sugars also makes the brew day quicker, as you can brew a strong beer with a single mash, instead of a reiterated mash. Sugar, when used at a rate of less than 20% of the fermentals, will also not contribute bad flavours or feel. Keep this in mind, because it's also key. There are many other types of grain that are used in this style in small amounts. Some recipes call for just two or three of them, while others are up to double that amount. Care should be taken in not adding too many that contribute strong flavours. This is probably not an exhaustive list, but it covers what is commonly found in a grain bill of this style. Firstly we have melanoidin malt at 5-15%, to much like Munich malt in ways, but with much more aroma and with a biscuit-like flavour. This malt also adds to mouthfeel, great for replicating the mouthfeel or maltiness found in decoction mashes and is great to use as a flavour stabiliser. More than 15-20% to will start to overtake a beer's flavour. Various different types of Munich malt are also used, usually at the rate of between 5 to 10 percent. These will add body and aroma with a malty sweetness and a slight biscuit flavour. Biscuit malt is also used commonly at 3 to 5 percent. This toasted malt will give bready and biscuit-like flavours and aroma as well as some colour. Crystal malt, also known as caramel malt, is commonly used at 3 to 5 percent. This is used for colour and mouthfeel, along with the caramel flavours that it brings to the show. The EBC of the crystal will be dictated by the desired end colour. Wheat is also used in various forms at between 3-5% to commonly. It helps with head retention and will provide texture. There is a slight backing taste, but probably unnoticeable when paired with stronger tasting malts like you would have in this style. Oats are also used in various forms, again at 3-5% to commonly. They are used primarily to add a silky texture. Special bee malt is commonly used at between 1-5%. to This is a great Belgian speciality grain that provides a heavy dark caramel taste along with burnt sugar, raisin and dark fruit dried fruits such as cherries and plums. It is also contributing softer roasty notes, but without bitterness or astringency. I feel this style is incomplete without this in the grain bill. Aromatic malt is also commonly used in this style at between 1-5%. to This malt provides a clean strong malty flavour and aroma, as well as some sweetness in the initial flavour. And lastly we have chocolate malt, which is usually used in this style at the rate of between 1-3%. to this provides dark colour to the beer along with roasted coffee and cocoa flavours. Let's now look at the hops that are commonly used for this style. To be compliant to this style we should really just use noble hops. There are actually only four different varieties of these as listed on screen now. One area of confusion for people is that the, each of these hops is sold in various different but similar names. I am scrolling these different variety names on screen now. This variety name simply determines the region that they were grown in. They all taste pretty much the same as each other. You can easily recognise which one is, I am sure, with just the last example being the exception. On top of this, there are other varieties that are also very similar, that are named differently because they are produced outside of the area of origin. Here are examples of other substitutions like these. Despite these being grown far away from their source, they work just fine and share the main characteristics of the mobile hops, so use them with confidence. In terms of hop edition times, it's very very common to see just two editions. One is for bittering and is usually done at the start of the boil. The second is for flavour and is traditionally made at 15 minutes. 
To beat a style for competition, it is best to follow this, but for your own use it is well worth you trying other edition times once you have tried the traditional ones. You can have a lot of fun with this, and dry hopped Belgian styles are actually becoming fairly popular. Let's now look at yeast. A Belgian style would not usually be complete without a Belgian yeast, but I have also had great results with fake yeast. The majority of fake yeast will not go up to this alcohol level though, but of course you can follow up with a yeast that will to get full attenuation, and you'll also get the same fake yeast speed benefits anyway. This also applies to other types of yeast. I have found that MJM31 can handle 13% alcohol despite its data sheets suggesting otherwise. Wine or champagne yeast can be used to finish higher alcohol examples. In my latest brew of this style I have started the fermentation with Vos Jana's Kveg and will use a wine yeast to finish it if needed. Due to this method I will only wait a month or two for the beer to come into its prime state rather than 6 months to a year. If you are new to Kveg then you will find lots of information in regards to it in my playlist entitled Norwegian Farmhouse Kveg Brews. I have no reservation in telling you that it will revolutionise your home brewing. Let's now look at mash steps. For more information on this topic and various temperatures and their effects please see the video displayed on screen now on my channel for a full explanation. But in brief, Belgian styles are well known for having multiple mash steps. Some of these traditional steps are not needed these days but anything in the range of between 60 degrees Celsius to 77 degrees Celsius is. These days, two to three steps in this range can develop a nice level of complexity in the end beer. It should be noted though the last step, usually performed at 75 degrees Celsius, is what we call mash out, and doesn't have an effect on flavour, it just makes the whole lautering process easier. Ok, so I will now share on screen a favoured recipe of mine to this style and will then explain it and give you some tips. I will then finish with some video footage from my latest brew of this style. Please do note that this recipe is for 20 litres and can be resized using various tools including the Grainfather Recipe Creator. This recipe is stored in the Grainfather Cloud and is also shared in this video's description. If you do not wish to have a beer this strong for whatever reason, then I would suggest removing the candy sugar first to the level that you are looking for. I went with 20 litres because this amount allowed me to perform just a single mash and still get the desired efficiency with accuracy of prediction. This of course is key. Ok, so I'll now quickly explain the recipe choices made for this brew. Firstly you will note a lower amount of parallel or base malt in this brew compared to a regular one. Usually we expect the base malt for this style to be 70% plus, but this one is at 62%. This is mostly down to the fact that I wanted to pack more flavour into this via the candy sugar, and also using the candy sugar have a body of this beer as close to medium as possible for drinkability. Dangerous I know, but this is how I like it. Because of this I have gone the full 20% with the dark candy sugar. You may question why I have set guidelines and then broken them. I want you to understand that nothing is set in stone. Guidelines and rules can be broken, but guidelines are a good path to follow when working out exactly how to go with recipe writing. In addition to the candy sugar's flavours I have gone for special B at just 2% of the grist, along with aromatic at 4 and also at 4 melanoid in malt. For me a beer style like this really benefits with additions that add texture. So I have added flaked oats and wheat which are both at 4% of the grist. These give the beer a great texture and a silky feel. This is how I like my stronger beers. These additions alongside the candy sugar will give this beer complexity of varying flavour, but without it being overkill. This beer will have the following flavours. Strong clean malt with dark dried fruits on a biscuit base. There will be some roasty notes in the background. The beer will have a slight sweetness to it, but will finish dry. There will be a nice balance between bitterness and alcohol that will mean that this does not taste as boozy as some quads. There will not be a noticeable hop presence at all. The hops in this recipe are there to balance the beer and offer some preservation qualities. 
These are the results that you'll get if you use Fermentis BE256. If you use MJ Triple Yeast, then you will get this a little bit drier. Without the use of Crake Yeast, I would suggest conditioning this one for at least six months, but it will no doubt taste a lot better in its peak after close to one year. Worth the wait if you have no access to Crake, but a no-brainer to use Crake if you can get it. With Crake, I expect this to be in its prime state in just a month or two maximum. To finish, I will show you some brew footage now from my New Year's brew of this, and add in some further tips as well. Because this is quite a large grain bill, at just over 7.5 kilos, I was particularly careful to stir in all the grain into the mash water, giving it plenty of attention before I started the mash. In addition to this, I gave the mash a stir for a few minutes every 20 minutes of the mash, to maximise on its potential. It's a strong beer and I really don't mind it going a little stronger than planned, but I also need to ensure that my minimum numbers are reached. Otherwise, this beer will be more bitter than I intend, and I really don't want that. Here is a quick look at the early mash, not dark at all at this point, but that soon changed when I added all of the candy sugar. During the boil I used a hop spider for the large amount of candy sugar for this brew. This meant no concerns over burning the bottom plate and not really a lot of fuss. I introduced this gradually after 15 minutes to the end of the boil. It dissolved fast with me stirring it in. So with a predicted brew house efficiency at 75%, the Beersmith prediction on gravity was 1.108. So this was quite improved on with the numbers you see here. I usually work to something like 85% to be quite honest. I just share recipes at 75% because I believe that is the numbers that anyone can aspire to. The reason for this change is essentially all of that extra stirring at work. Because my main yeast will not be tolerant to this level of alcohol, I will finish this one off with wine yeast. And the danger is that it will stop once it is past neutral or a thousand gravity points. So this one will end up as over 16.5% alcohol. Not too shabby for a beer, but more than I expected and certainly drier than I want for this style. I might let it go a little sooner, let's see. It will mean using a fermentation stopping chemical which I am not so keen on, but such is life. If you are not familiar with this chemical, then it is potassium sorbate. It simply stops the yeast from regenerating further by adding a coating to the yeast cells, effectively making them sterile. It's more of a wine thing, but of course it works just fine for beers also. But please do note that if you use this chemical then you will be forced to keg this beer, rather than having the option of bottling. Naturally you would still add fresh yeast to a beer like this after long term conditioning, but the sorbate presence will probably still render the fresh yeast added later as sterile also. This now wraps up this video. I appreciate that this one was a little longer than usual, so thanks for hanging on. I hope you enjoyed it. This style is certainly a longer topic than many, as you can no doubt appreciate. I do hope that you found this video interesting, informative and useful. If you're watching this soon after release, then Happy New Year to you. So if you did like this video, then please do like it on YouTube. This really helps me out and allows the videos to be seen by a wider audience on YouTube. I have always got a lot of new videos planned for the future, so if you are interested in seeing my new content, then please subscribe for future content. If you have any questions on anything that I have covered in this video, or any other video, then please do not hesitate to get in touch with me via YouTube or Facebook. I'm a member of pretty much every Grainfather Facebook group and more. Happy brewing!